All right. Okay. Uh, good evening, boys and girls. Welcome to the party. Um, okay, cool. Welcome, guys and girls. Everyone's joining the party. Um, for some reason, my camera is not working. I have no idea why. Um, okay, let's go to slide share and begin our little lecture. Um, slide show. Begin. On the beginning awesome source okay can everyone hear me um sounding good uh as i said i don't know why my camera is not working but hopefully the microphone is on form for tonight okay so we're doing part one of our lectures about the carnivorums tonight okay all right cool bananas okay i've got a confirmation that um admitting everybody to the party okay guys um let's begin our class okay so as always the book of the week is the kingdom field guide to african mammals it doesn't only cover south african mammals or southern african it covers all the mammals of africa and a whole bunch of primates it's a really good book if you can find it they've got it in kenya it's about seven or eight hundred rand in kenya i'm not sure if they have it in south africa though i'm sure you can order it online We've got a whole bunch of people arriving a few minutes late. That's fine. Okay, cool. So, um, more people arriving. Let's get on to carnivores. Oh, wow, lots of people arriving. Okay, so today we're focusing on the order carnivora. So not all carnivorous mammals are in this order, obviously. Um, we did marsupials last time and monotremes. And for example, there are cetaceans, which are whales and dolphins, and there are also marsupial carnivores, which are carnivores, even though they're not in the order carnivora. So carnivores are meat eaters. They may consume any part of the animal, not just meat. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. All carnivores have a carnosal shear and carnosal teeth. Carnosal teeth are used to cut and slice. And all carnivores are characterized by a fusion of the bones in the foot. This allows them to have increased gripping strength and increased ability for grappling with prey. While they might appear very different, carnivores are remarkably similar in their basic physiology. They are very similar. Everything is really cosmetic and relates to their specific uh, life cycle, lifestyle. So, we're going to look at some physiology today, specifically at the skull. So most species have heterodont teeth. And what does that mean? It means they have differentiated teeth. We've got four different types of teeth, so they're heterodont. Homodont is when they are all the same. Most reptiles have homodont teeth. So you can see this guy over here. He's got incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. So he has heterodont teeth. This is a coyote skull. Canines also have a distinct sagittal crest. So if you look at the back over here, this ridge of bone running along the back is what we call a sagittal crest. And that's where all the muscle and bone wraps around to and gives them all that increased biting strength because the whole of the upper skull is an anchor point for the jaw muscles to cling on to. Okay. And then, sorry, we've got a couple of people riding a little late. And then the next thing is that the skulls compared to a lot of animals tend to be more heavily built. So you can see it's quite robust compared to something like an antelope. Obviously we're ignoring elephants because they are gigantic. Um, but what you can see here with this, with this boy over here, this coyote, even though he's quite a slim animal, he has quite a robust skull and he has these distinct um, zygomatic processes under his eyes, which are quite strong and actually give the skull a lot of strength. The eyes are also binocular, which you can see over here, eyes face forward, and this gives him three-dimensional vision, and he can see targets with both eyes. Prey items, by contrast, have very poor binocular vision, and, but they've got a wider range of vision, so they can see around themselves. Predators typically don't need to see behind them because they're doing the hunting. They're not being hunted. 
So a robust zygomatic arch protects the eyes. And this is this ridge over here, a zygomatic arch. And this protects the eyes from prey. Obviously, if you're a predator and you're taking on an animal with horns or with some sort of, uh, with teeth or fangs or whatever, or hooves, you want to protect your eyes because your eyes are everything. So these zygomatic arches over here are very robust and actually help lighten the skull's weight, but at the same time provide extra structuring. Think of it like a grid around the eyes. You won't, you'll notice that it doesn't occur above the eyes because they're trying to lower the skull weight, even though it's quite robust. But these big ridges over here uh, are far more prevalent in canines than in felines for the reason that canines tend to do more of a full contact type of uh, predation where most cats, by contrast, are not are more stalking and stealthy. Ooh, Debbie Marshall arriving a little bit late. Okay, so the nasal cavity also has enlarged turbinate areas. And you can see that so, yeah, this is these are the turbinate areas. Guys, if you could put your microphone on mute, that'd be super duper. Okay. Um, so these large turbinate uh, or nasal conches are inside the nose, and this has an increased um, surface area, giving the animal incredible smell or sense of smell. Not sense of smell. Um, they also, so we're now going to be talking about specifically about the caniforms, and caniforms are dogs and their relatives. So the caniforms, literally the dog forms, and they have non-retractile claws. They have also, most of them are plantigrade. Remember we talked about plantigrade last session, those animals that walk in the hole of their foot. Canines are the exception, they are digitigrade like cats. Um, they're not true carnivores, as in the sense that they're actually omnivores. They eat plant material and animal material. The feliforms tend to be true carnivores, as in 100% meat. Um, they tend to have longer faces and more teeth. The fact that they've also got longer faces means that they have a far more developed, I'll show you the picture, a far more developed uh, turbinate structure inside their nose, and it gives them a far greater sense of smell, okay, than cats. So dogs and their relatives have far more powerful senses of smells than cats. Cats are pretty good, far better than humans, but nothing compared to dogs and their relatives. Okay, they tend to have longer faces and more teeth. They also have a single inner ear chamber and that's really semantics the hearing is um well it's, it's just an evolution mechanism cats have two inner ear, make, uh, inner ear chambers where dogs only have one although dogs tend to have better hearing by contrast okay and this is purely relating to sex and breeding but all caniforms lack a cowper's gland now the cowper's gland is something that all mammals have except for, for caniforms, and it's a gland that um, provi provides lubrication, and um, um, basically it's just a lubricant for, for, that comes out of the penis that helps um, lubricate when the animal is having sex. And all caniforms have this, whether it's a dog, whether it's a bear, whether it's an otter, they, none of them have this. Now, it's nothing really, unless you're studying uh, the actual breeding of the animal, it's nothing important, but it's something that unifies all the caniforms. None of them have it. Another thing, they have a very long baculum, a penis bone. Most mammals have penis bones. Humans are one of the few mammals that don't have penis bones. Uh, and that probably comes from the fact that we walk upright and having a semi-erect penis all the time is not a good idea if you're an upright animal, um, to be very blank or blunt about it. And um, what's also interesting is that the caniforms contain the largest and the smallest carnivores. So the filiforms don't actually have the largest carnivores um, or the smallest. Okay, so now we're talking about canidae, the canids. So regarding canids, um, canids are, uh, generally live in monogamous pairs, the vast majority of them. The larger canines tend to form family-based packs. I'm just going to put you on mute here. Okay. And um, these family-based packs usually are dominated by an alpha male and an alpha female, and then all the submissive partners around them. Okay, and all the, the young pups, which is usually a family-based organization. So not only wolves and wild dogs live this way, there are a lot of other animals, and even um, dingoes live this way, coyotes have been observed to live this way occasionally, even jackals have been uh, noticed to live in packs every now and again, not just solitary or in pairs. Uh, olfactory communication is extremely important in canines, far more important than in felines, as I said earlier. And the vision is not as good as in felines, but hearing is probably better with most species. So felines focus more on their vision, canines focus more on the hearing and their smell, particularly their smell. And predation, 
Guys, please put your microphones on mute. Yeah. Um, predation is either uh, cooperative or solitary. So they'll either hunt in groups or they hunt solitarily. If they're hunting in groups, they will obviously go for bigger groups. Solitary prey usually means they're focusing on themselves and smaller animals to eat. And they're not going to hunt the buffalo on their own. Okay, so locomotion. It's quite important when it comes to dogs. So wrist bones and the forearm bones are fused. They're unable to rotate their arms like cats. So they're not able to move their arms from side to side. They can only move them backwards and forwards. And they have narrow, deep chests built to contain large lungs. They have incredibly large lungs. They also have a heart that weighs up to 1% of their body weight. This is substantial. This gives them a tremendous amount of oxygen and blood pumping through the body. So they're able to move very, very fast. So the specialized limbs are extremely poor for gripping. If any of you have got dogs, you can see how much they suck when it comes to handling balls or grabbing things. They're not very well uh, adapted compared to cats. But instead, they're built for speed. So canines can trot. This means an average walk, a casual speed of about 12 kilometers an hour. This is a pretty steady jog for most humans. So you running at a comfortable, solid jog is the same as a dog walking at its normal speed. When I talk about dogs, I'm talking about wild dogs, as in wolves and coyotes, jackals, not your little Pomeranian. Um, but a Pomeranian can barely make one kilometer an hour. Okay. So compared to felines, canine boats are extremely thin. Again, because they're built for speed, they're not built for, for impact and durability. They're not rugby players, they're long distance runners. So this is the build of a canine. You can see it's actually got very, very thin bones, uh, very, very slight spine, the ribs are very uh, petite, compact, the tail is relatively compact. Even the skull is not that robust compared to felines. If you compare, over, you can see over here, overlaid with the body of a wolf, you can see how much of the wolf's skin is actually, or the, uh, the, the filling around it, doesn't actually make up that much more of the body. Compared to a cat, like a lion, and you can see there's a significant amount, obviously ignoring the mane, but if you're looking around the chest, around the thighs, around the shoulders and the back, there's a sig significant amount of filling out around the animal. There's a lot more musculature structure and a far more robust build. Also, the face is far more compact with, with cats, in particular lions. And again, those heavy, heavy foot feet that are not fused as much as with dogs, so they can obviously bend them and twist them. It's far more effective at grappling. Dogs are designed to run things down. Cats are designed to impact and to pull things down. We got another person arriving late. Okay, so the ecology. Canines are highly opportunistic predators and will take anything that they can catch. Uh, most species dominate grasslands and bush belt and occasionally woodland thickets, especially wolves and coyotes. Uh, they're noticeably absent from jungles and dense forests. They just don't operate that way. They don't hunt well in dense, in dense, dense bush. They're not built for it. And they play an important role in keeping prey mobile. If any of you guys have watched the documentary about Yellowstone Park and the behavior of the wolves and how they actually influence the movements of animals in the park and then it actually improves the quality of the soil and the quality of the grazing in the park because animals don't stay in one area for too long and they're constantly moving and giving the areas of the park time to recover. So predators are incredibly important for actually keeping prey mobile and ensuring the health, the health of an area. And that's one big gaping flaw in American ecology is that they have this anti-predator mindset that's very archaic and that comes from that old trapper uh, fur, key, uh, fur hunter and um, sport hunting days where they love to kill the predators and that mindset still hasn't disappeared out of American ecology and only now um, they're starting to catch up and realize that predators are very important but a lot of reserves refuse to keep predators on their property. Um, being omnivores they play a surprisingly large role in sea dispersal. Dogs play a huge, when I say dogs I mean all dogs, uh, play a huge role in sea dispersal, far more than people give them credit for. Um, jackals in South Africa eat a lot of um, small things like jackal berries, for example. A lot of the coffee plants are eaten by jackals and they're dispersed. Because the digestive system is very inadequate and not good at breaking down cellulose, most of the seed is left intact and then the, the, the seed is defecated out in a nice little pile of manure and they are able to germinate quite nicely. Oh, Ian's a bit late. Okay. And uh, canines are a fairly young family, with most species being less than 2 million years old. That's very young. Bear in mind that modern hominids, humans, have been around for about 4 million years. So the modern uh, canines are half as young as us. 
And that's actually quite substantial because this is the reason why they had such a big sudden impact on pack hunting uh, cats. There were, used to be a large number of pack hunting cats a couple hundred thousand years ago, a couple million years ago. And only in recent history, when I say recent, I'm talking in ecological history, uh, the canines have been out competing pack hunting cats and solitary cats have become more common. So they've out -competed, as I said, out competed pack hunting cats in many areas of the world where they've settled. And wolf expansion is partly due to a rapid series of ice ages that Earth has experienced during the Pleistocene era. And that's over the last couple hundred thousand years from about a million years ago until now, we've had a rapid series of ice ages and those have just created these open glacial um, steps and ideal hunting ground for wolves, not so great for cats. And the wolves are just really just thrived in those areas. And when I say wolves, I'm also talking about any other canines. Canines are partially responsible for the collapse of pack hunting cats, as I've said. It's a golden back jackal over here from Sri Lanka. So they have two main types, stalking, and, uh, which is reserved for smaller prey, and pack rundowns, which is cooperative chasing, isolation, and nipping of the prey until it drops exhausted from blood loss and shock. Uh, all true canines, including jackals, employ this method. I've personally watched a pack of cat jackals hunt down a deer in uh, Sri Lanka. So they don't only go for opportunistic small prey, they also hunt in packs when given the opportunity. This is a pack of wild dogs hunting down a wildebeest, employing the same method. So territory. Canines mock their territory with olfactory and auditory cues. Uh, urine feces are well known, especially amongst domestic dogs. Anal posting markings is more common in the larger canines, uh, less common in the smaller canines. Howling, of course, if you've got a dog, uh, we all know that howling is an important component of any canine species. Um, and if you have jackals on your property, you'll hear your dogs howling back at them. And canine territories are extensive, far larger than felines of the same size. So they have gigantic territories. And in the past, jackals would have, uh, not just jackals, but wild dogs in South Africa would have territories ranging from Durban up to, to Ladysmith and right up to Shishlu and down again. And one pack will cover a range of that entire territory. And wolves have the same behavior uh, and various other species around the world will also have the same behavior compared to cats, which have got very small territories by com contrast. Breeding. In most canines, only one pair typically breeds. That's usually the alpha and male and female. And new packs are formed by dispersal males and females that expel from their packs. And breeding is usually in the summer and the females are known to have multiple litters through the year. Mortality rates are actually very high amongst pups. So they might have 12 pups, but usually only one or two make it to adulthood. Now the skull is elongated with narrow teeth. This is not an animal for dragging down and, and, and biting and killing play quickly. This is a, a skull almost like a pair of tweezers. And they nip and they tear at moving prey, gradually bleeding it out through exhaustion and through, through just constant removal of body parts and just making life living hell for the poor animal. Um, the jaws are unable to move sideways, making it very ineffective at chewing, so it rather just tears chunks off and swallows them whole. And the skulls are less robust than other canning forms. So dogs, compared to a lot of the other guys we're looking at today, are much, much, much less robust. And canines have pro pronounced sagittal crests. So you can see over here with this coyote skull again, a really pronounced sagittal crest. That whole area around is where the, the, all the muscle for the jaws would wrap around to, would pass through the zygomatic arch under it and then wrap onto that uh, sagittal crest of it. And you can see these distinct canines that are very pronounced in sizes for nipping and plucking and tearing and then quite robust um, uh, carnosal shears, which is therefore just breaking down and chewing and crunching away things. And again, they have very, very, very long uh, rostrum over here, which is, uh, supplies all that internal turbinate structure, which allows for a far more effective um, smelling apparatus compared to cats. This is a cat skull over here. You can see that's the, the rostrum over there. They have very, very small nasal capacity. You can imagine how ineffective. But by contrast, look at the size of the orbits of the skull for the cat. Cat has significantly larger eyes. Also, the zygomatic process over there is very small, very petite, but he does have a massive sagittal crest at the back of this. He's got a lot of biting power, but a quite a petite, delicate face with very little emphasis on smelling. So cats, by contrast to dogs, 
a very different type of hunter. And again, the actual uh, the teeth are not there to chew and crunch and break through things. So they're not, they're less opportunistic. They are more focused on their prey items. And again, you can see the incisors, they are quite by contrast underdeveloped. They're not going to be nipping and grabbing a prey. Uh, now the, can the caninas, which are a subfamily of the canines, are wolves, dogs, and jackals. These are the most widespread. And there are 10 species worldwide. They have 78 chromosomes, which means that you can get hybrids occurring. You can get a half dog, half jackal occurring. You can get a half dog, half wolf occurring. You can get a half dog, half coyote. You can get a coyote and a jackal interbreeding. Very common occurrence. There was, um, the problem is with this is that you, you get the worst qualities of both. There was a country singer named Taylor, not Taylor Swift, Taylor something or another. She was killed about 15 years ago in one of the national parks in the USA uh, by a pack of uh, wolf coyote hybrids. And the coyotes are a lot more aggressive and opportunistic where the wolves are just bigger and stronger. And these hybrids, which have occurred because uh, coyotes have been chased out of their native areas by humans and they're now interbreeding with wolves. And they're taking on the worst behavior of both species. And in many areas, they've actually seen hybrids of domestic dogs and wolves flourishing. Um, so it occurs a lot of the time. And through species we're gonna look at today, the most widespread predator on earth, the gray wolf, with a distribution range historically from England, right through Europe, right through Northern Africa, right through Asia, right through North America, and into some parts of the, the Arctic area as well. So the gray wolf has the largest distribution range on earth. Second uh, to that is, uh, is the cheetah. I'm sorry, the cheetah, the, the leopard. The neck, of course, is the doll or the Indian wild dog. Uh, very similar to our wild dog in many respects, just looks a lot more like a jackal. And then, of course, our boy here over here, the African wild dog. So these are three of the most well-known canines. But again, there's 10 different species. We're not going to get into all the species today. Now, the group are the South American canines, the Ceridocionina, which are limited purely to South America and Central America, obviously. Uh, again, these are 10 species limited to five genera. And one includes the bush dog, which is super cute. I mean, he's a tiny little fellow like that, but he is adorable. That's them at their max size. The next guy is the maned wolf, really long-legged. He's a swamp specialist, and he hunts in swamps and, and heavily reeded areas. And the crab-eating fox, which is quite a cute little fellow. It doesn't look that different from our jackals in Southern Africa. The next group we're going to be looking at now, the vulpini. We've got two species in South Africa. I think you know both of them. And they're found worldwide. Uh, there's 11 species, three genera. The Arctic fox, really cute little fellow, limited to the northern hemisphere. The bat fox, one of our little fellows over here. And of course, the raccoon dog, which is found in the Americas as well. Okay. Sorry, not in the Americas, in Asia. And absolutely adorable little creature. A raccoon dog is in no way related to a raccoon um, beyond the fact that they're both caniforms. Um, but he just happens to look quite similar. And the foxes, again, are more, these guys do not hunt in packs. They are specialists. They also live in, in monogamous pairs. And they're far more opportunistic little hunters. And they just go for small things like birds and reptiles. And finally, the Eurocyons, which are only two species alive today, the North American foxes. These are only found right in the north of North America. And these are the Island Fox, who's this adorable little fellow over here. And the Gray Fox, which is this adorable little fellow over here, which is found on the eastern side of Canada and northern United States. Okay, so first today, we're talking about bears. So those are the, the true canines. Now, Caniforms also include various other species. The next species, next group of species we're talking about are the bears. Now, like other caniforms, bears rely more on smell than sight. Uh, unlike canines, true canines, bears are known to hibernate up to 100 days during the winter. That's incredible. They just go to sleep, they shut down, they go into a torpor, their body temperature drops up quite a few degrees and they do nothing. And bear distribution uh, is worldwide. Only Africa has no native living bear species. We did until 150 years ago though. So let me tell you about a tragic little case of the um, Atlas bear. Now the Atlas bear was a subspecies of brown bear. He was a rather big boy, if you guys know the brown bears from Europe and North America. 
and um, they existed well since Roman times. And the last, the numbers declined over 2,000 years until the last Atlas bear was killed by trophy hunters in Morocco in 1870. So they are now extinct, unfortunately. But these were the only bears in Africa uh, until very recently. And hopefully maybe one day we can do a reintroduction program from brown, brown bear species. Okay, now bears are highly opportunistic carnivores, but unlike canines, plant material makes up the majority of their diets. They prefer heavily wooded areas simply because of their build. They're not built for, that, for, for outdoor areas. Okay, someone arriving very late. And bears have a low population density, density, but very few threats. They grow slowly, they live for quite a long time, and they have very low density, but very few things, like elephants, very few things actually threaten them beyond humans. The only real threat to a bear is a human being. And again, purely because of territory, or because of competing over, 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 over resources, or for sport, people kill them for sport. And they have, because of the fact that they're mostly vegetarian, they have very little impact on prey populations. They do prey on animals, but it's opportunistic. So it'd have to be a very sick or very old or very elderly animal or an animal that's very wounded anyway and wasn't going to make it. So they don't go out and chase down deer or chase down moose. It's just something they're not built for. They do raid bird nests and they do take um, uh, ducks out of rivers and they do obviously prey heavily on um, on uh, rabbits and those sorts of things. And obviously the polar bear is exclusively carnivorous because nothing grows in the Arctic. So they are the exception. And being omnivores, again, like canines, they do play a surprisingly large role in sea dispersal, a lot more than people give them credit for. So bears are generally solitary, unlike true canines. And olfactory communication is extremely important. They have anal glands. They also have glands up and down the sides of their body. So when you see bears rubbing themselves on trees, it doesn't mean they're just necessarily itchy. They're actually marking their territories as well. Uh, people think the bear's got an itch on his back when he's rubbing up and down the tree, but it's actually him marking. The vision is not as good as feline, but hearing again is probably better. And the predation is usually opportunistic. And bears use their size and aggression to chase up potential competition. They're just the big bullies of, of, of their areas. They rely on their strength and their aggression. And they are very tough to kill. Compared to other canines or uh, caniforms, they are very, very tough. And they're not as overt in keeping territories. And their territories are more of loose overlappings. They don't actually have distinct territories like dogs. They, it's more of a, this is my area, I'd prefer if you don't come into it, but um, I'm not going to be too perturbed if you do. And again, because the population densities are very low, these interactions themselves are very, very low. They're not going to encounter each other very, very often. And male bears, when they do come across younger bears, will happily kill male and female uh, bears. Um, if it's a sexually mature female, he'll obviously mate with her and court with her. But if it's a juvenile, chances are he's going to tear it to pieces and eat it. Cannibalism is very common in bears, and it's been observed with many species. Now, breeding. Breeding social structures vary as much as humans. I and mean, you get monogamy, you get polygamy, you get polygyny, you get females mating with many males, you get males fighting with many females, you get, you get seasonal monogamies, permanent monogamies. And they're like humans, where it just really depends on the individual. So what a, one brown bear will do and what another brown bear will do purely is the prerogative of those individuals. They just make up their own choices in life. And good luck to them, you know, they're obviously happy with what they're doing. I don't judge, it's the 21st century. And typically courting involves playing and wrestling, as in with humans. <laughs> so, um, no, they are, um, they, they have a, a lot more fun, a lot more, I'm sure you guys have watched them in the videos with, with panda bears. Again, they pay and they wrestle with each other and it looks like they're just having fun, but actually it's an important aspect of mating and courting and bonding with the bears. And they'll only actually ovulate when the male penetrates the female. So they don't go into estrus like dogs do or cats do. They, um, they actually need to be penetrated in order to ovulate. Now, what's really interesting about bears is they go through embryonic diapause. And this is a stage where the embryo actually goes into a shutdown. It goes into a, um, on a standby status for a couple of months. So if the, the, the bear is uh, impregnated in a certain time of the year where there are not enough resources, she can actually control the development of that embryo for a few months until uh, the season's opportunities are a bit better and there's more food around and obviously there's more water and more resources and then that embryo will start to develop. So her hormones actually affect the development of the, the, um, 
of the embryo. And this is a well-documented um, occurrence amongst many of the caniforms, but particularly in bears. You can see, this is a skeleton over here, you can see how much more robust compared to the canines, the bears. He's a heavily, heavily built individual. He also has a plantigrade foot structure. He walks on the entirety of his foot, simply because of the weight of him. He's much heavier, far more robust, and he needs to have that plantigrade foot structure. He can't walk on his tippy toes because he's going to break his poor little toes. And again, a lot more muscle wrapped around his back. Okay, and again, you can see over here, he's got these huge zygomatic uh, arches around his face purely because he's a heavy brawler he's got quite small eyes indicating that eyesight's not that important to him if you look at those large robust canines they can't also see his shears there but his molars are also more like uh, a herbivore's molars that he's able to crush nuts and fruits and that sort of thing and he's a really big thick chewing apparatus over here and you can see going how far forward those canines actually sink into the skull and how strong and robust his canines are. The zygomatic arches, as I said, were really, very powerful and robust. He is a brawler and a brute, acquiring uh, enlarged uh, rostrum over there. And they're really, really, really powerful uh, sagittal crest, which gives them that just that incredible bite strength. So you don't want to mess with a bear. Okay, so bears are very heavily built, and the skull is extremely dense for a carnivore, a lot more dense than any other caniform, simply because they are tough as nails, and they have to be. And they do not have as powerful bite compared to the size of other predators. Although it's hard for a caniform, it's extremely powerful. If you had to compare it to a lion or a hyena, it actually wouldn't be that impressive. But for a caniform, it's pretty damn impressive. And their size and weight are more adapted to dealing with competition, colder climates and um, um, just basically interaction with other bears and predatorial behavior. They need to be big to compete with other bears. And also um, the colder climate is a major aspect about that. We'll talk about that now. So another group of bears that we're talking about today are the pandas. And one very widespread is with numerous, uh, they're once very widespread. There were numerous species. Today there's only one species alive limited to China. And of course is the panda bear. He's primarily herbivorous, but he does occasionally eat meat, but he is mostly a herbivore. He eats bamboo shoots. The next group are the short-faced bears, which are limited to South America. They prefer high altitude montane forests. They love climbing trees. And what the only surviving species today is the spectacle bear. He's not a very big boy, but he's quite cute. Then you get the ursinae, which are the true bears. And they're widespread throughout the Northern Hemisphere. Again, they used to have as, as large a distribution as the gray wolves, but they've been extirpated out of many areas, including England. They have been reintroduced into England recently though, which is quite exciting. And there are six species today under one genus. I'm sure we all know the polar bear, the classified man-eater, an absolute beast, 900 kilograms, the soft bear. He tops out at about 100 kilograms. He's only the size of a rod filer though. And the brown bear, which is known as the grizzly bear, the Kodiak bear, or the brown bear, depending on where you are in the world, or the Siberian bear, and the Atlas bear, which used to occur in, in Africa. So, um, why are bears so big? That's an interesting little thing. And we're going to talk about two concepts today called island giganticism and island dwarfism. It doesn't only relate to islands. And simply put, in closed ecological environments, large animals get smaller and smaller animals get larger. Or someone's arriving very late. So we have some well-known examples. Um, in the, oh, weird. Obviously, gorillas being in a closed ecological environment, they've gotten bigger and bigger and bigger over time. They, if you compare them to their cousins, chimpanzees, uh, who are much smaller, live in lowland areas, on, which are not closed ecological environments. Gorillas, simply because they live in very mountainous areas, which are closed ecological environments, animals get bigger and bigger and bigger through competition over finite resources. The biggest one always wins. By contrast, big animals uh, go through a dwarfism where there are fewer resources. So if you're a little bit smaller than your neighbor, you survive a little bit longer. So every generation you find animals getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, a lot of elephants on islands are significantly smaller than elephants on mainland. In Sri Lanka, their Asian elephants are smaller. Uh, in Greece, they used to have African elephants and they were tiny. They used to come up to your shoulder. The mammoths, which were four, four meters tall on the mainland, didn't even come up to two meters on the northern islands of Russia. Um, the Colombian mastodon, which lived, it was a rainforest elephant, uh, or elephanted, and that went extinct about 3,000 years ago. 
And um, that was also in a closed ecological environment and simply because it was a closed ecological environment with fewer resources, they shrunk in size. And we are talking about two other concepts today. The one rule today is Allen's rule. And Allen's rule means that in a warmer climate, your body shapes will be more linear. You want to expose your surface area as much as possible to reduce heat. By contrast, uh, in colder climates, your body shape is more rounded. So you don't want to lose heat in the colder climates. So you tend to be more rounded. That's why bears are far more robust. They dominate colder areas and they tend to be far more rounded, whereas wolves um, also are quite rounded compared to something like the doll or the African wild dog. Coyotes as well tend to be more elongated. And even with the most obvious uh, noticeable, noticeable cases are with foxes. Foxes in colder climates tend to be fluffier and rounded. Foxes that occur in warm climates tend to be very elongated and thin. The other rule that we're going to look at today is Bergman's rule, um, which comparable species are larger in colder climates. So wolves in warm areas are smaller than wolves in, in cold areas. Um, and again, if you look at something like dogs and even different species of dogs like uh, wild dogs and wolves, which are very similar ecologically, the wolves are substantially larger. The larger the animal, again, the, the, the greater the resources, uh, the greater the, the, the should I say, the, the, the greater the warmth the animal can, can um, hold on to. Whereas if you're a smaller animal, you, you, you lose that warmth a lot quicker. Your metabolism is high and you, and you burn the heat faster. So you want to be far cooler in a, um, you want to be far smaller in, an, in a um, warm environment. So we're going to wrap up today, boys and girls, uh, before we go into the seals, which is on Friday. So we're doing a walk and talk about seals and the rest of the caniforms on Friday. And then on Saturday, we're going to continue with our Q&A. So I hope you guys have learned something today. Uh, if you have any questions now, we've got about four minutes left before we need to continue with our sessions. So, I mean, we need to end the session off. So if you have any questions, I can quickly answer them. Any questions? Hi, Andre here. Yes. Hi, Nick. Thank you. You spoke about the um, dogs. Well, I don't know if dogs or hyenas particularly having more than one litter a year or something like that. Mm -hmm. Previously in the crew, I've witnessed a uh, hyena, spotted hyena or laughing hyena with two different size cubs. Could yeah. they possibly be the mother with two different litters the same year? Possibly, but maybe it's possible. And remember, they do adopt, but hyenas are not in any way dogs. They are, they're filiforms, they're related to cats. Okay. We're doing them next week. Um, but yeah, uh, in family units, adoptions happen all the time. So uh, you often find that maybe she's, she's nursing her sister's uh, uh, pups or um, it could just be from a multiple litters because multiple litters do occur in nature all the time. So that's quite common. Um, but yeah, but hyenas are not, not, not dogs in any capacity. Um, so, Ooh, but yeah, uh, but adoptions do happen quite a lot. Uh, any other questions? All right, that seems to be all for tonight, guys. Okay, so we're going to round off for tonight. Um, if you have any questions, you have my WhatsApp number, or you can save it for the Q&A on Saturday. And then uh, Taylor Mitchell, there we go. There she was the, 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 the country singer that was eaten by a hybrid of coyotes and wolves back in the mid-2000s, I think. So, um, yeah, not Taylor Swift, Taylor Mitchell. Um, and then, yeah, okay, we continue with Caniforms Part 2 on Friday. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, stay safe. Um, thanks for popping in. Hope you learned something. All right. Arif Adichie. Thank you. Shane. Adios. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheers. I don't know what's happening. It's been weird. Uh, oh, there we go. Cool. Okay. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye.